There you go. Pull it off the granite slab. Come on, pull it this way. What's that? Okay, seriously, a cicada on my veil. When will they go back into the ground? What's up? I'm David Burns, and if you want to keep healthier bees and avoid horrible mistakes, please subscribe to my channel. You'll enjoy these videos so much. Today we're going to talk about the interaction a little bit uh, about how bees interact with cicadas. But we're going to focus mainly on these 17-year Gen 10 cicadas, known as the Brood 10, I guess. I didn't really know much about them, and I got so interested and so many things about them, I decided to make a video just about these cicadas. And get this, I saw them in 2004, now I'm seeing them again, and if I eat my Wheaties and stay in shape, I'll get to see them again when I'm almost 80 years old. So let's jump right into it. This is Long Lane Honeybee Farms and it's down a Long Lane. When I first bought the property in 2004, that was the year of the 17 year cicadas. And guess what? They're back. That's right, I've lived here 17 years and now these cicadas are back. Why do we have cicadas? I mean, what are the benefits? They're loud, they are annoying, and they're only around for two to four weeks, and then they're gone, these 17 year cicadas. So why are they here? Well, as a beekeeper, there's a term you need to become familiar with, if you aren't already, and that's biodiversity. Biodiversity means that everything is working, interacting together, for the better of the ecosystem. Today, I interviewed Philip Nixon. Philip Nixon, nice to meet you. Thanks for coming out to the bee farm today. Glad to be here. Yeah, I uh, understand that you're a cicada expert. Grew up in Illinois, yeah. a little bit south of Springfield. Moved there from Kansas when I was five. And, and uh, I went to a community college at Lincoln Land Community College in Springfield, Illinois. Finished my in biology and then did a bachelor's and master's at Southern Illinois University in zoology, the master's concentrating in entomology, mm -hmm. and then went to Kansas State University, got a PhD in entomology at Kansas State University. Uh, in 1980, I started uh, work with the Cooperative Extension Service, University of Illinois, in the Chicago area, and was up there for seven years, wow. and then moved to uh, Champaign-Urbana, and spent uh, 30 more years in household entomologist for the University of Illinois Extension. Right, yeah. Wow, well the credentials uh, are there. <laughs> Sounds like you're going to be able to answer my questions. <laughs> Should be able to do a few of them at least. That's an impressive resume. And as you can tell, Philip knows a lot about cicadas and other stuff. You're here at the bee farm. When I moved here, Philip, back in 2004, I bought this place. And once we moved in here in 2004, this is my first time to live in the country for a long time. And I said to myself, oh my gosh, I made a horrible mistake. Because you moved right in on the emergency. Yeah, I didn't know what it was. And I said, it's too loud to live in the country. All my trees were full of cicadas making this horrible racket. And I said, how can anybody live you in the country? You mean beautiful song? <laughs> okay, yeah, it is a beautiful song. <laughs> <laughs> what you're hearing now is a cicada that experiences emergence every 17 years. So for 16 years, I guess, they just spend time underground eating juices from tree roots. But in 17 years, here they come, coming up out of the ground and then hanging out in trees. And why do they do this? How can anybody live in the ground for 17 years? Well, before we jump into the next section, and please give me a thumbs up. This will let me know whether or not you like this kind of content that I create. And subscribe to my YouTube channel means so much to me. And please click on the bell so you'll be notified each time I make a new video. Now, let's get right back in the video. We do know that there are no predators that have a similar cycle mm -hmm. or multiples of mm -hmm. cycles, except 
one year. They went overboard in trying to avoid predators, and it appears to be a predator avoidance thing. I see. In that uh, there are really nothing uh, below ground that has a cycling yeah. such that it's able to uh, able to handle the uh, uh, the increase in size and thus mm -hmm. food value mm -hmm. as the nymphs underground feeding on tree roots get get older and larger and and more food for your yeah. for your catch well, how big are, uh, how, and there's nothing above ground that does that either how big are the nymphs underground the nymphs will of course start out at uh, at about uh, uh, they're they're a little under a quarter of an inch about oh, an eighth of an really? inch to a quarter of an inch what and, do they look uh, like a worm or they, uh, look like they look just like the shells that are on the sides of uh, of the buildings and oh. are, are on the sides of trees and except they're a smaller size. Do they move? And massive legs. They that, move a lot in the ground or not? They don't do a lot. They will initially. In mm -hmm. fact, uh, they will hatch out of, uh, out of eggs up into the tree branches. And when they hatch out as nymphs, they free fall to the ground. They oh. don't climb down. They just take a, take a wild leap. Are they a quarter? And so some of them are falling 60 feet or more. So you could go out and see them then? Theoretically, if you're if, if you're sharp them, enough eyes yeah, and catch them at the right time, so they fall to the ground, fall to the ground, tunnel in, in yeah. find a root, latch on, and if everything's perfect, after 16 more years they come back up. Wow, it's amazing. Uh, they commonly will have to change roots, but yeah. not always. Uh, how, how deep do they go to avoid cold weather? Uh, they can well, they can handle. Uh, uh, they will they will go down fairly deep. They can go down a foot or two. Uh -huh. But most of them are in the eight to eight inches to a foot range, okay. mm -hmm. which is within the realm of frozen soil. Mm. So they're obviously adapted to freezing. Wow! As most insects are yeah. in temperate areas. I mean, if you can't handle the winters here. You got no business being here. You know, <laughs> yeah, right. Not everybody's like the monarch butterfly and takes off from Mexico for the winter. <laughs> so this nymph, then uh, they they come out 16, 17 years later, and they come out looking like. A full-grown uh, cicada at that when they come out. They of the come ground? out as a nymph. Oh, they do. The nymph and will crawl up the trees part way, and then they will split the back of their skin and come oh, out as an adult. Is that right? Yeah. That's why I find all these skins around. That's right. That's the oh. those are the cast skins. So, what's the purpose of a cicada? After all, have you ever wondered that? I mean, what's the purpose of a cockroach? What's the purpose of a mosquito? What's the purpose of a mouse? What's the purpose of a fly? What's the purpose of a cicada? Especially when your lifespan on above the ground is only two to four weeks. Well, think about it this way. Here's some interesting facts that might change your mind and might help you consider biodiversity. Did you know that the cicada, the female cicada, actually plants her eggs in the tree branches? When they're laying eggs, they will insert their eggs into the stem. They have a ovipositor, an egg-laying device, which yep. is able to slice open the uh, tree branch. And normally it's, it's quarter-inch diameter branches, pencil size. But they can get up to as high as an inch and a half. Mm -hmm. And they will slice open an area and lay their eggs. And where they're numerous, they can be a real problem, particularly in the fruit-growing industry, because uh -huh. if you've got young trees out that you've just planted, uh -huh. And usually they plant whips that are about a quarter of an inch in diameter. And, yeah. and so for a couple, three years, they're, they're under that inch and a half size that, on the trunk, which mm. if they, uh, as they call it, stitching enough of the trunk, yeah. uh, they will uh, cause a tree to die or mm. get weakened enough on the trunk that it snaps off in the wind, which is the uh, same thing if you're I trying see. to grow fruit. So Amazing. Nurseries that, that grow young plants have to be a little careful if they're in a cicada area I see. to avoid having real young trees out yeah. there when they're... Interesting, because when they emerge, now they're going to go up into the tree and mate, and the female will plant her eggs and small twigs in the tree, which helps a large tree, a mature tree, because it causes some of those small twigs to break off um, and then those twigs are replaced by more growth on that tree. But then what's interesting is all the males die and they fall to the ground. And when they do, that becomes fertilizer for the soil of the tree, actually giving that soil more nitrogen. It's all working together. Did I say biodiversity yet? Between 17 years, I still see the skins 
every now and again on my trees. Yeah. So who are they? Why are they Those here? are what are called annual cicadas. Oh. And the annual cicadas will come out every year. They have typically, there are many different species of those. And they have a three to a seven year life cycle, most of them. And so they do the same thing, go underground, feed oh. on the roots as nymphs, come up, shed their, oh. come out. And uh, and you will start hearing them typically yeah. in the latter part of June, early July. Many cicadas that are annual cicadas, they are more cautious. I mean, if you see one, they'll walk behind a tree. Uh, they're also called dog day cicada for them coming out during the dog days oh, of summer. Yeah. They're out during July and August. And you'll hear of a wheeze, a wheeze, a sound in yeah. the evening. Yeah. They are night singers, evening singers. Mm -hmm. And they come out in smaller numbers. Mm. Uh, the periodical cicada just kind of comes out with the idea that you can eat as many of you as we <laughs> want. There's way too many of us yeah. for that to work. Yeah. And so they sing during the daytime, sit out in the open, wow. say, you know, birds, just eat all you can. You're going to get stuffed, and there's plenty of us yet to make. You know, it's not <laughs> a big deal. So true. You know, just, just go for it. You know? I, I heard that there's trillions this year. Yeah. There's Right in the middle of the day when everything with a mouth wants to eat them. But they don't care if something eats a cicada. They don't care because there's hundreds of more to replace that cicada. Not hundreds, thousands of more. No, not thousands, millions of more, even trillions. Trillions Whereas, when they come out. Whereas the annual or dog day cicada, they sing it in the evening or and, and up to usually about 11 or, or, yeah. 12 or 1 in the morning. And, uh, and they will, if you happen to approach them, they'll walk around the branch yeah. to be on the other side. Yeah. Uh, they're very secretive because there's not so many and the birds could easily pick them all off yeah, or, right. or bats or whatever the case may be, yeah. uh, be it in the evening. So, um, so they're, they're much more secretive. In honeybees, uh, we have the queen that will go out on a mating flight and she will mate with up to 20 different drones on that mating flight. Do these cicadas only mate with one? Or do they also have a time to mate with many of the males at one time? I would assume that they mate repeatedly, although okay. I don't know. Okay. That's something I don't really know for sure. Okay, interesting. 17 years is still a mystery. How do they determine when the 17 years is up? They have a calendar? They're just flipping, saying, oh, we got two more years? There's a Nobel Prize. No. <laughs> if you know the answer to that, there's a Nobel Prize. Wow. Uh, underground, you know, it's hard. I can't keep track of my time when I'm out and about, but underground, they're trying to do that. Well, it's thought that it has to do with, with weather, but that can't be all of it because in uh, some sort of biological clock, but... yeah. It's not another known, mystery that another, we solved. A mystery, wow. like I said. There's a prize in there. There's, right. a, there's I'll a, work on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can figure I'm that out. I'm trying to figure out how could I get a Nobel Peace Prize? Well, there's a new there's, way. There. There's, there's one way. There's an option. <laughs> All right. It wouldn't be a Peace Prize. It'd be a science prize. But oh, yeah, yeah right, it's right. Nobel anyway. That's, yeah. that's true. Yeah. So I have to go to Sweden and dress up. I, I would do that. <laughs> <laughs> in Illinois, we have several broods that come out, as they do throughout the East. Uh, the, the periodical cicada is unique to the eastern United States. This particular brood, as they're called, actually reaches from maybe central Illinois, if you draw a line through the U.S., all the way out to the east coast. They're kind of this section of the U.S. In fact, if you go a few miles to the west of where I live, you won't find any. But you come to my house, they're everywhere, and they're thick. Well, tell me about... Can you eat them? Do, does anybody eat these cicadas? Uh, they were eaten by the Native American Indians. Yeah. Uh, there are people that make a deal out of eating them. Wow. I don't get into that sort of thing. I'm not a dietitian. I don't yeah. know yeah. the ins and outs of that. So as an entomologist, I tend to stay away from that topic. Sounds, but, sounds kind of uh, crunchy, doesn't But there it? are people that eat them. I've had other kinds of insects, but yeah. I've never eaten cicadas. But. <laughs> These aren't going to hang around a while. People might be saying, oh my gosh, how long does this last? But I think by the end of June or end of July, they're pretty much back That's in the ground. Well, it. In fact, uh, the, uh, the song or the noise, as West you want to know, only lasts for about two weeks because the males are, will die after about two weeks. Mm -hmm. Females hang on for another month or so to lay eggs. Oh, but they don't make any sound. But they don't sound, make any sound. So... Uh, people will feel like, well, the cicadas are gone. Well, no, they're not. 
Yeah. Uh, the so-called, if you want to think of them as important ones, the one yeah. for generating the, the population are still hanging around and, hmm. and laying their eggs and so on. And yeah. so we'll start seeing damage to uh, the ends of tree branches and so on, uh, typically in, yeah. uh, in the second half of uh, yep. July. You mentioned the idea about some people call them locusts and other yeah. people call them, what's the difference? Well, locust is a grasshopper. A grasshopper. And, uh, and uh, we have migratory grasshoppers, they're called migratory locusts that occur in Africa and so on. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the, um, and in other parts of the world, there used to be ones that occurred in the western United States, but they went extinct for some reason, we don't know why. Mm. Uh, but, uh, but at any rate, uh, if one looks back at the early settling of this country, uh, most people that came to this country, many of them were here for religious reasons, mm -hmm. and uh, they probably only had one book that they owned, and that was the Bible. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to look at, and, they, and realize, of course, that this doesn't happen in Europe, where most of our first colonists came from, uh, they would have come out and they go, to, what's all this going on? Just like you did when you first came here. Yeah. And they'd say, well, you know, uh, it's... Uh, you know, what, what do we find? Well, let's look in the, the good book. You yeah. know? And they would find the plagues of Egypt, of the locusts, associated with, with uh, Moses trying to get Pharaoh yeah. to let go of the, of the Jews. One and of so the on. ten plagues. One, yeah. of the ten, one of the yeah. plagues of Egypt. And they would say, well, it must be that. So we'll call them locusts. I assume that's how oh. I got the name of locusts. And other, other experts would feel sound kind of similar too. Mm -hmm. But um, well, they're only distantly related to, to grasshoppers. They're, say. they're more closely related to, to aphids and, yeah. and leafhoppers and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but I think that's kind of, and that's kind of been passed down, obviously for the last hundred years or so on, our main book hasn't been the Bible to look for information, but Mm -hmm. uh, colloquially, that name has just oh. continued. So locusts are grasshoppers? Locusts are grasshoppers, And yeah. they don't fly, do they? Uh, I mean, yes, they, they do. as adults they do. And, mm. and those that are, we call, the ones that actually f form locust swarms are migratory grasshoppers. Mm -hmm. And they actually will have, the, of the same species, as they get numerous, they develop longer wings and a mm -hmm. propensity to fly more than, than the ones that are the stay-at-homers. Yeah, the ones and I see around here, they just kind of, they fly. They, they but fly, but not very not far. far. Yeah. But, uh, but, but that, those particular species, particularly we have them more in Africa, and we've had some locust yeah. plagues in the last few, few years. In fact, we had one last year mm. over in Somalia and so mm, on. Yeah, I think we're right. having one still this year in Somalia uh, and, and those in Tanzania and some of those areas. And those individuals that make up these big locust swarms that you may see on television, you look on the Internet, that will blacken the sky, have longer wings and, and are different in what they do, but, but uh, when they finally settle down and mate, they produce hmm. the same shorter winged ones, even though they can fly, they're not real long winged. Yeah. And so there's a difference in, in, physiolo in, in appearance, yeah. physiology, but they're the same species. I'd say. Studies have shown that there's a 10% increase in red-headed woodpeckers after cicadas have presented themselves as a food source for birds. In the animal kingdom, well-fed animals and insects have much more offspring. Two to three years after the last cicada emergence, blue jays were much, much higher in population. Another interesting fact is, before the emergence of Gen 10, there is a drop in bird population. Is it because the ecosystem waits until the bird population is lower and it's all timed out? for 17 years that there's less birds to eat them? Or is it the opposite? Is it because there's fewer birds and birds are declining and so the emergence of Gen 10 actually helps boost up the population of birds? I guess you'll have to decide. The last time the nymphs emerged from the ground here at my house, I had just moved here in 2004. Let's see, 2004, that means that the first iPhone was three years yet to be invented in 2007. And then I heard about Massaspora, this fungus that actually grows and takes over the abdomen of a cicada. Here's an example of the Massaspora fungus that has eaten off the rear abdomen of this cicada and has plugged it. It's still alive, but as you can see, there's no abdomen. It's 
actually a white kind of a plug of fungus that will just grind away and finally take over and do away with the cicada's abdomen and they can still live and fly about. But what's interesting is about this uh, fungus is studies have shown that this fungus actually contains cathinone, which is an amphetamine. So you have these cicadas flying around with half of their abdomen gone, being plugged by this fungus that's giving them a sense of being high. So they are on drugs flying around the sky looking to have a relationship with the next female they encounter. What an awkward life. Insects are so interesting. Well, thanks for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me tell you about the next video that's coming out later this week. We're going to make a video tracking Bella the bee. We're going to actually go in and take a bee when she emerges from her cell, a worker bee. We're going to mark her with a red dot. This year the queens are with a white dot, so we'll mark Bella with a red dot. Hopefully we'll see her easily. And we're going to kind of trace her from day to day to see what she's doing in the hive. Kind of get an idea of watching her grow up. I'm hoping eventually we'll be able to videotape her flying out and, and going somewhere and gathering up some nectar. Later this week, uh, be sure and tune in to my video on Bella the Bee. It will help us learn what bees do and kind of get used to, uh, kind of get in our mind about the progression of work that bees do as each day they age. That'd be a fun video and material that's important for you to learn as a beekeeper. So watch for that coming up. I'll see you next time and remember, continue to get a buzz out of life.